Hello everyone and welcome back to our Sky Tonight program. This is Seth Mayo, Curator of Astronomy for the Loma Planetarium at MOAS. And in this edition of the program, we are covering the dates of November 14th through November 20th. We're going to start by saying farewell to the late summertime constellation of Sagittarius. Then we're going to mention the peak of the annual Leonid meteor shower going on this week. And we're going to end with a look at the wonderful Andromeda galaxy we can see for most of the night at this time of the year. So let's get to it. Now, as we make our way deeper into the fall here in the middle of November, we can still see a leftover summertime constellation that's just holding on in our southwestern part of the sky. Now, keep in mind, if you live farther north, you probably don't see this grouping of stars anymore, or at least it's very low in the sky. For us in more southern latitudes, we still have a chance to see the half-man, half-horse constellation of Sagittarius that I can turn on the picture for it, the outline of it here in Stellarium to see it once again. Usually I mention the teapot shape right here. There's a handle, there's a lid and a spout. That's the asterism for the constellation. The rest of it is supposed to form the horse part of the body. This would be actually the torso or somewhere on the torso of Sagittarius. That's the human side of him. And then his arrow is actually sticking out here, kind of where the teapot is located in this area of the sky. Turning on the picture, of course, gives us a clear view of this constellation from Greek mythology. So it is getting pretty low in the sky, but I just want to mention it because you still have a little bit more time to see it. And of course, if you stay out a little bit later after sunset here, we're actually going to still see that galactic center. It is also still technically visible at this time of the year. We can find that there. That's the brightest part of the Milky Way that is now making its way towards the southwest and western part of the sky. So if you do have any really clear skies and it's really dark, you still have a chance to see that really beautiful part of the Milky Way that's always worth looking at while it's still in view until we see it next year and again in the summertime when it rises back up in the evening out of the southeast. So we can say farewell to the constellation of Sagittarius while we still have a little time left to see it in this part of the sky. Now coming up here on the night of Thursday, November 17th, or really the morning of Friday, November 18th, we have the peak of the annual Leonid meteor shower. I love talking about this meteor shower. It's just a great time of year for meteor showers in general. And the Leonids radiate from that famous Greek constellation and one of the signs of the zodiac known as Leo the lion. And you can see here in Stellarium, it's just rising in the east here. You can see the hook or the sickle of Leo. That's the asterism that forms the head of the lion just rising. This is in the early morning of the 18th here. So let's turn on the outline of that and turn on the picture. This is a famous spring constellation. You start to see kind of in the late night hours at this time of the year. And as you stay up later and later, you'll see Leo rise higher and higher in the sky. The radiant point for the Leonids is actually in the head, and it's actually easy to locate because the hook is fairly noticeable in the sky. So if you look inside that kind of hook shape that you find right there that forms the head of Leo, that's the radiant point where if you watch the meteor streak across the sky, you can actually find them radiating from that point, or at least near that point during this meteor shower that typically runs for the entire month of November, usually about November 3rd to December 2nd. And the Leonids derives from a fairly famous comet known as Comet Temple Tuttle. And this is a comet that of course leaves behind a debris trail of ice and dust. And those particles are raining down our atmosphere here in November, usually peaking around this time. Comet Temple Tuttle is a short period comet only taking about 33 years ago around the sun once. And the next time it makes its close approach to the sun is in 2031. And when it does so, the sun will heat it up and it may emit more material around it that Earth will fly through at some point in the future. And the Leonids historically have produced some of the most amazing what are called meteor storms when there can be thousands of meteors per hour. But we're not expecting that even anytime soon. It's actually predicted that the next big meteor storm could happen by the end of the century, about 2099. So we have some waiting to do for that. Typically, the Leonids give us about 15 meteors per hour. But the really fast meter is about 44 miles per second or 71 kilometers per second. Very, very fast moving meteors. And on average, you get more fireballs from the Leonids, the much larger meteor particles that really shine in the sky and have really long tails and streaks across your view. 
The only bad thing is if you're looking at this in the early morning, which is usually best to view meteor showers, you'll find that Leo will rise higher and higher and falling behind it is the crescent moon. Now it's not the largest phase of the moon, but the light pollution from the moon may make it difficult to see some of the fainter meteor streaking overhead. So it might not blot out all of them, but at least some of them because the moon is still a large enough phase to add a little bit of extra light. But I think that's still a nice view to have Leo and a crescent moon there, and maybe, just maybe, a stray meteor from Comet Temple Tuttle streaking overhead at this time of the year, coming up on the evening of the 17th or the morning of the 18th. Around this time of the year, you may hear me talk a lot about a really famous and nearby galaxy to us known as the Andromeda Galaxy. I think it's a well-known name when it comes to galaxies in our universe, and it's a galaxy at this time of year that can be seen for most of the night, which is great. So this is part of a fall grouping of stars, and since it's fall, it makes sense that this would be out in the sky. If you're looking more towards the east and really the northeastern, Part of the sky. So the Andromeda Galaxy is something that's not super easy to see with your naked eyes, but technically it is visible if you have a dark enough sky. It's actually the farthest object you can see with your naked eyes, which can be amazing if you do spot it. If you can't, because I know a lot of us have some light pollution around us, there is a simple way of finding Andromeda. And it's by using an easy to find constellation I've mentioned recently, and that is Cassiopeia that we find right here. Cassiopeia, as you know, looks like a W in the sky. We'll kind of draw it out here so you can at least see the W shape of this queen sitting on her throne. If you look at kind of the top side of the W right there, it looks like this little triangle right here, but you can think of that like an arrow kind of pointing in this direction. This would be the point of the arrow right there, and if you use that point there and you kind of point in this direction towards the south, that may lead you to this little smudge in the sky. And again, that smudge would only be visible to your naked eyes in a very dark location. And that's not a terribly far distance there. We can actually measure it here with a angle measurement tool here in Stellarium. We're going to move from that point to this little smudge right there. This is about 15 degrees of arc there. So to put that in perspective, your fist held at arm's length is about 10 degrees. So this is about one and a half fist lengths apart at arm's length from that point in Cassiopeia to the approximate location of the Andromeda galaxy. At least it may get you generally in the right location to find it. And the galaxy nearby is part of the constellation of Andromeda. We find here that's Princess Andromeda, the daughter of Cassiopeia and I'll turn on her picture as well. So the Andromeda Galaxy is kind of to the side of the main stars of the constellation, but it is in that area, so that's why it's been given the name, the Andromeda Galaxy, as we see here. Now, as I've been mentioning, I said that's a little smudge, but that description doesn't do it justice because this is totally not little. This is a very large galaxy about two and a half million light years away. The light takes about 2.5 million years to travel from Andromeda to get to your eyes here on Earth. It is not close by any means, but it is the closest large spiral galaxy to us in our local group of a little over 30 galaxies in that group. Now, of course, we call this the Andromeda Galaxy. It used to be called the Great Nebula in Andromeda because it actually looked like a nebula, like a gaseous cloud. And it's also known as M31. That's the Messier catalog number. But the Andromeda Galaxy is a really good example of a large spiral galaxy, much like our own Milky Way. And it was thought for some time that this was more massive than our own galaxy, but it turns out that the mass of our galaxy and Andromeda might be pretty similar at about a trillion solar masses, which is a lot of mass, of course. But we're pretty confident that this galaxy is larger than ours at about 150,000 light years across, as opposed to our own galaxy that's about 100 to 120 thousand light years across. So this one's kind of stretched out a little bit more. And if you've seen me talk about Andromeda before, I always go back to this amazing image, one of the sharpest images ever taken of Andromeda. And this was captured by the Hubble Space Telescope and released in 2015. And this is actually from a web page that you can access and you can zoom in to just one part of the galaxy, a 61,000 light year stretch that contains about 100 million stars. A 100 million stars is insane. 
And as we zoom in here, you'll find right in this area to the left, that's the galactic core. Of course, it'd be a black hole in the very center. And you can actually zoom in and actually see the individual stars like grains of sand. And the stars that are brighter and closer to us, those are stars in our galaxy in the foreground. But the little dots behind them are actually stars in Andromeda. As we sweep across here, we can really see how dense those stars are. The clouds, these arms that hold star clusters and all sorts of features within Andromeda. The detail here is extraordinary and I just love sweeping past this, zooming into various sections. The resolution is astounding as we zoom in that galaxies can hold this many stars. And this is just one neighboring galaxy. As we span across here, you can see those star clusters I was talking about there that can hold very old and a lot of stars in them and all different colors of stars, red, blue, orange, yellow stars, telling you the different temperatures of them spread all across the Andromeda galaxy. So that's just one little section of Andromeda. You can really see the amount of objects that are actually there. And if you didn't know already, we're actually getting closer to Andromeda because the Milky Way and Andromeda are on a collision course. Don't worry, it's going to take about four to five billion years. But at every moment, we're traveling about 68 miles per second closer to the galaxy. That's about 110 kilometers per second. And when that occurs, these two galaxies will kind of blend together, kind of sweep out and then kind of slowly come back together again in this really powerful and large cosmic dance. And eventually, over time, will form into one large elliptical galaxy. And this is the fate of many galaxies around the universe as the gravities from these various large islands of stars kind of pull in each other into these much larger galaxies, typically called elliptical galaxies. So over time, our view of this galaxy will get better and better. It'll get larger in the sky, get brighter. But again, this takes a very long time, something that we can't relate to in human lifetimes. But eventually, that will occur with Andromeda and our own Milky Way. So this is a great time to possibly take a look at this. Now, if you can't see with your naked eyes, binoculars are great, or a small telescope even. You might see a little smudge with those devices. Larger telescopes may resolve even more. And if you're into astrophotography, this is a very popular target. For those who can take long exposures of an object like this, you can really see the details. And even a relatively small telescope if you have the right equipment. So hopefully you're able to find Andromeda near Cassiopeia. Maybe you can find it with that constellation in the northeast. And again, you can see this for most of the night kind of rising higher and higher in the northern part of our sky at this time of the year. Hey, thanks again for tuning in to another episode of our Sky Tonight program. And if you happen to find yourself in Daytona Beach, please stop by the Museum of Arts and Sciences and maybe catch a show in our Loman Planetarium. We hope to see you around here sometime soon. And please check out our website for more information about what's going on and our various social media channels. We post so much great content from around the museum, as you may already know. So hope to see you back here again. And of course, happy stargazing.